This presentation today describes economic democracy wealth pumps, the solution to the economic malaise that is unfolding before our world today. It is fully explained in the book titled Economic Cures They Don't Want You to Know About, which is available on the website www.economiccures.com. There are two fundamental problems with our economies today throughout the world. The first problem is the price gap. Wealth is expressed as the gross domestic product of all goods and services produced by a nation. If that's true, there's never enough money to pay for the wealth that these nations produce because the system is fundamentally flawed. How so? Well, let's let A equal wages, profit, and dividend costs of production. Then we'll let B equal all other costs of production. And finally, let P be the price, which is comprised of all of the A plus B costs of production, the wages and all additional expenses such as capital acquisition, depreciation, uh, buildings, computers, electricity, energy, etc. So here's the problem. If all we have to meet the market price with is our wages, then how will we ever be able to meet that price? The following mathematical expression would need to be true. If the prices that comprise our gross domestic product are comprised of the A costs, all of the wages and earnings, and the B costs, all of the other costs, then how could it be that the money paid out as wages and earnings will ever be sufficient to meet the price comprised of A plus B? That, of course, is a mathematical impossibility. The second problem which has been with us for hundreds of years is fraudulent usury, which is the systematic stealing of the wealth of our nation by the issuing of a dollar and demanding the repayment of three. Think of musical chairs, where there just are not enough seats. It's a mathematical impossibility to repay back three billion dollar bond on a billion dollars issued when you never issued the interest in the first place. This is the true nature of our national debt. So what exactly is it that they don't teach us in our schools today? Over 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson said, the modern theory of the perpetuation of debt has drenched the earth with blood and crushed its inhabitants under burdens ever accumulating. Did they ever teach you that in school? And at the birth of the nation, John Adams said that all the perplexities, confusions, and distresses in America arise not from the defects in the Constitution or Confederation, not from want of honor or virtue as much as from downright ignorance of the nature of coin, credit, and circulation. We don't understand money, folks. Do they teach you that in school? And Adams also said there are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword. The other is by debt. Did you ever hear that in school? Almost a hundred years ago, Frederick Soddy, a Nobel Prize laureate, said, By allowing private mints to spring up, Parliament has fundamentally and perhaps irretrievably betrayed democracy. He wrote a book that explained exactly how to solve the economic problem I'm introducing to you today. Did you learn that in your university studies on economics? Thomas Jefferson is credited with destroying the first reserve bank that had been created by Alexander Hamilton, the nation's first Secretary of the Treasury. Before destroying the bank, he had warned Congress in debates over the extending of the charter of America's first central bank. He said, If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their forefathers conquered. Did you ever learn that one in school? It was a tough fight that took years for him to prevail, but he did prevail in destroying the bank, after which decades of prosperity and price stability prevailed in the United States. In fact, throughout the 19th century, the total inflation that occurred over the entire hundred years was less than 30 percent. But we can't give Jefferson all the credit for that, because not 30 years passed before a second reserve bank reared its ugly head, and we had to have Andrew Jackson step up to the fore to destroy that bank. He was so proud of his accomplishment that he had engraved upon his headstone, I killed the bank. He considered this his greatest achievement. He set this objective in his 1829 address of Congress when he said, You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the eternal God, I will rout you out. If the American people only understand the rank injustice of our money and banking system, there would be a revolution before morning. Did they teach this to you in high school or economics? 
But the most damning testimony comes from one of the banker's own, Sir Josiah Stamp, who was a director of the Bank of England in 1927, was reputed to be one of the richest men in the British Empire, and he said, The modern banking system manufactures money out of what? Nothing! The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and was born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them to power to create money and control credit, and with the flick of a pen they will create enough deposits to buy it all back again. However, take this great power away from them, and all the great fortunes like mine disappear, and they ought to disappear, for this would be a happier and better world to live in. But if you wish to remain slaves of the bankers, and pay your own cost of slavery, let them continue to create money and have control over it. Do you want to continue to let the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Schiffs, the Warburgs, and all of the financials of the world continue to have this kind of power over you? It's time to wake up. Did you ever learn this in school? If you've never heard these things before, then there's something about the way money works, the way economics works, that you don't understand, that you need to find out. Because if you don't, you will continue to be the slave that Josiah Stamp spoke of. Our problem is critical reasoning versus cognitive dissonance. That cognitive dissonance is massively encouraged by our media today, and you need to be aware of it. The evidence before us tells us that we need to kill central banking again, specifically the Federal Reserve, which has been in place since 1914. We're continually presented with the notion that we have shortages. Shortages of fuel, shortages of trees, shortages of air, shortages of water. But is that really true? For example, there's the proposition that we have a shortage of building materials. Perhaps there's a shortage of trees, but they're not our best choice for building material. I would propose that we would use earth, the oldest building material. The oldest buildings that stand on earth are made out of it. Maybe there's something wrong with the choices that we're making. Then there's the proposition that we have a shortage of steel. Well, we haven't done any primary steel manufacturing since the 1980s. Everything that we make today is fabricated out of arc furnaces uh, with recycled steel and alloys. And then we're told that we have a shortage of oil for things like plastics and fuel. Well, I'm of the notion that using oil to manufacture things is absolutely insane other than for plastics. We have no shortage of energy as was demonstrated by Nikola Tesla over a hundred years ago. Read my book and find out all about that. And then there's the proposition that we have a shortage of energy when we have geothermal, hydro, wind, and radiant energy that could meet all of our energy needs today. We haven't even examined energy from the vacuum yet, and this incredible source of energy has been basically figured out for over a hundred years ago, but it's been a suppressed technology. And then there's the notion that we have a shortage of labor. How is this possible when we have robotics, industrial automation, which have basically set things up so that we need as little as 20 to 30 percent of our workforce to accomplish 100 percent of our production. We have to come up with make work projects just to keep people working. So exactly why is it that we have poverty in the land of plenty? This question was asked over a hundred years ago by many of the intelligent economists of its day. And what exactly is this leisure dividend? Who owns it and why don't we receive it? The leisure dividend can be expressed as a farmer who with a combine, a harvester and a thousand acres can produce enough wheat to feed 2,000 people all the wheat that they need for a full year. This is technology leverages. And this is a benefit that belongs to we the people, not to private interests and bankers. And here's a big one. If money is backed by us, as our bonds say, by the good faith and credit of the people of the United States, then why do bankers charge interest on our property so that we're effectively paying for our own slavery, exactly like Josiah Stamp said? Oh yes, there's something about the way our world works that we don't understand that we had better find out. We need to wake up, find out, stand up, and step up. We need a wealth pump. But exactly why do we need it? We need it because the core problem is that we have a gap between the cost of society's goods and services and the consumer's ability to pay for them. We need to solve that problem, and we need to solve it without bankers' usury. Let's illustrate with a concrete example. We're going to look at a number of cycles of production over a period of time progressing from left to right. In our first cycle, we have our A costs of production, which are comprised of wages, dividends, and profits. Call it $10 million dollars. 